speaker is going to be Brother John West. You know, back in the uh, 19th century, there was the old saying, Go West, young man. Well, John came to us. He went west from Alabama to Texas. Certainly, Alabama's loss was spring's game. But I imagine he made that move while he could still be called a young man. John is a, a good man. I know that. He was born in Aberdeen, Mississippi. His uh, father, brother, and uh, father-in-law are all gospel preachers. He's married to the former uh, Sonia Caldwell. They have three children, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua. And we certainly appreciate their good family here. Spring has been strengthened by their presence. He pre preached uh, full-time in Mississippi and Alabama. He's conducted the Oslo meetings and lectureships in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas, and here he lives. And we certainly are glad he's here. <laughs> this evening, John's going to be speaking to us on the topic of the Lord's Supper and unity. And I know he's going to do a good job. He does a good job every time he speaks. And we look forward to hearing from him. John's going to preach to us. Thank you, Jack, for that introduction. I have to tell you, this Saturday, we were up here at the building doing some, I guess, final preparation. Brother Sister Green came in. Sister Green said, well, when did y'all get here? I said, July. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we had to explain why I've been here since July. It is good to be here with you. I know after we moved, I found a sign, and I have it hanging in the house now because I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as quickly as I could. So we are happy to be here in Texas with you and part of the spring congregation. If you would, this evening, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, our subject at hand tonight that has been assigned to me is Biblical Unity and the Lord's Supper. This is a subject that must be dealt with when dealing with unity because of the problems that we're seeing around the world and the brotherhood and the denominational world in general with the subject of the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, we find that this supper was instituted uh, by Jesus, beginning in verse 26. We're going to read through verse 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you that I will not drink henceforth from this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is Matthew's account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a subject that is most misunderstood and grossly perverted by the denominational world and many within the church as well. It is also an event that has been forsaken and neglected by God's own children. When people who claim to be Christian, God's children, according to the teaching of the New Testament, forsake the assembling of the saints on a Sunday, a given Lord's Day, failing to meet, intentionally staying away, they have failed in that great supper in which we come together in communion to remember what Jesus has done for us, but also to gather in unity as we partake of that Lord's Supper. The Lord's Day is a wonderful time in which Christians gather around his table in communion to remember a great sacrifice that was paid for our sins at Calvary. The true Biblical unity of the Lord's Supper that we'll discuss tonight is a precious occasion that brings us together. And sadly, as we just stated a moment ago, it is being perverted and misused all around this world. I want to look as we begin this, this evening at some facts concerning the Lord's Supper, some general observations about the Lord's Supper before we go any further. The Lord's Supper, first of all, is a memorial. It is a memorial which we can come remember on the front of many tables, many congregations, are the words, this do in remembrance of me. Because when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he instituted as a memorial 
for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So we know that it is a memorial. Memorials have special meanings in the lives of most people today, especially Americans. We have memorials set aside in our country for various days. Memorial Day for us to remember our soldiers who gave the ultimate sacrifice. We remember days such as the 4th of July, say Memorial Day to remember the freedom that we enjoy in our country. We observe other days of memorials. We have monuments around this country that are memorials to certain individuals or certain things and events that have taken place to give us the freedom that we now enjoy. The Lord's Supper is also a memorial on the spiritual side of this for Christians to remember what Jesus has done for us. I want to encourage you just for the next few minutes to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, had to deal with not them taking the Lord's Supper, but with the abuse of the Lord's Supper within their assemblies. I want to begin reading in verse 23, and we'll read through verse 29 of 1 Corinthians 11 and discuss this particular passage. He said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, And when he had given thanks, he prayed and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often ye this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinking, drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Look at the solemn occasion upon which Paul wrote these brethren. The time when they were coming together in worship to remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And yet they were perverting and misusing the Lord's Supper at Corinth. And Paul had to write and correct this error. He could not let this error go unnoticed. This memorial done in remembrance was something that they were failing to see. The way they were perverting and mixing it with a common meal. Someone said, just as the team of the unknown soldier bears the witness of the death of a soldier for his country, so the Lord's Supper bears the witness of the Lord's death for man, and the Corinthians failed to observe it correctly. And they were bringing shame upon the Lord and his church. They were eating and drinking damnation to the soul by perverting that very thing which they should be glorified. The Lord's Supper is a memorial, but it's a memorial that looks back to the death of Christ. It is also a memorial that looks forward to the coming of Christ. If you notice verse 26 of our text, or of this passage, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. When we partake of the Lord's Supper each Lord's day, we're not only thinking back to what he did for us at the cross, but we're looking forward to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to bring an end to the things of this world, where we can meet him face to face and spend eternity with him in heaven. Not only that, the Lord's Supper is also a memorial that points to the new covenant. Verse 25, after you took the cup and supped, Satan, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. When we take the Lord's Supper, do we realize that when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, that it wasn't just for the remission of our sins, but it, that it was also to establish the church as well as a new covenant? Read the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews is very clear on this subject. In the manuscript, I, I did take time to go into the book of Hebrews and do some comparisons with the book of Hebrews and with what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because it helps unfold that very thing for which Jesus died. The New Testament. 
We have a New Testament now because of his death on the cross. We ought to be thankful for that. And in that memorial, we need to remember that. What are the elements of the Lord's Supper? This is what we do. We come and partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine. The bread being that first element. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he instituted unleavened bread, Luke 22, 14. Representing the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. We think about that representation. And I have this in the manuscript. We might travel from time to time and most of us keep pictures of our family in our wallets, our bill phones, or wherever we might keep them. Someone might ask about our family and we show a picture of our family and say, this is my family. Well, we're not saying that picture is my literal family, the picture is, but it represents who my family is back at home. We take the Lord's Supper, the bread, we're taking of that which represents the body of Jesus which hung upon that cross. The fruit of the vine is that which represents the blood that was shed for us for the remission of our sins, looking back, thinking about what he has done for us. It is that which we are contemplating as we look forward to the coming of Christ, thanking him for the New Testament that's represented in that. For the church, which was established as a result of the blood shed. I want to make one comment about the fruit of the vine. Literally, it means the juice of the grape. Well, there are a lot of discussions in the religious world, and some even among the Lord's church, whether it should be fermented or unfermented. And I've got some material where I've read both discussed, both defended. The Bible tells us we're to take the fruit of the vine. There's a Greek word in, uh, in the New Testament where uh, we have the word wine, the Greek word oinos, which can refer both to fermented or either to fermented or unfermented wine. But in instituting the Lord's Supper, he simply states the fruit of the vine or the juice of the grape. That should be clear enough and simple enough for us to understand without going into a, a lot of defense as so many people in religion do to defend their unauthorized practices. <coughs> but as we go further as well, looking at the cup, the fruit of the vine, the Bible tells us, as we read in Matthew 26, I read Matthew's account, Mark's account in Mark 14, and Luke's account in Luke 22, of the institution of the Lord's Supper. He tells us to drink the cup. We don't hear as much about it today as maybe was discussed back in the 50s and 60s and some of the 70s about the one cup doctrine, the one cup annies. But folks, it's not hard to understand as well when we talk about that cup. I did, I've done some research about the cup as, as far as their position, their stance, and why they try to defend it. But it's very simple to understand. It's a simple law of hermeneutics called metonymy, which the container is made to stand for its contents. We commonly employ this figure in everyday language, such as, did you enjoy your tea? And he states, I drank the whole cup. Well, he enjoyed his, his tea, his drink. He drank the whole cup. It doesn't mean he drank the container, but he drank the contents. You're going to liquefy the cup and drink it as well? I mean, we need to use some common sense when it comes to God's Word. I think common sense is used in a lot of areas today, but when it comes to religion, common sense goes out the window. And it shouldn't. But going even further. Illustrate is like when the kettle is boiling. It is the, the iron kettle actually what is boiling or the contents within that kettle boiling? We understand when we say the kettle is boiling, that whatever's inside is boiling, not the kettle itself. Moses declared uh, in Genesis 6 that the earth was corrupt during the days of Noah. Was he talking about the old dirt? The trees were corrupt. Oh, we've got the corrupt trees in our world. <laughs> Think about it. No, he was referring to the inhabitants on the earth. When Jesus stated as recorded by John in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, was he talking about that God loves the trees and the grass and the flowers and all the pretty little cutesy things that we have in this world? Or is he talking about the inhabitants of the world? 
It's obvious. But he's talking about the inhabitants that he loved enough to send his son to die for. The cup in Luke 22 and verse 20 was said to be poured out. Luke 22, 17, it was said to have been divided. Divided among the disciples. Matthew 26 that we read at the beginning of the lesson, verse 27. He said, drink ye all of it, for the cup was drunk. We're not liquefying a solid container, but drinking the contents within that container. What's interesting to me, I've heard of at least one such instance or occurrence, and I don't know how many more like this, where the one cup Annie's, they didn't have one cup. They had two. One for each side. Now you tell me the logic in that. So they're going to use one cup, but have two cups, one for each side. If we want to get literal, if they want to talk about the cup, let's go back to the bread. He took the bread and broke it. Now there are more than one piece of bread, several pieces probably in uh, the container tonight for those who are the and it says the bread. If they follow their doctrine all the way through and they only have one cup, then that means they can only have one piece of bread passed around the entire order course. Well, they won't follow that. They'd probably have separate containers to go down each side of the bread as well. It just does not hold common sense or logic or any type of sense you can think of. But why someone would believe such and defend such a practice the way it is being defended by some today that we have to deal with. Now let's go on secondly. I want to talk about the authority for the Lord's Supper and unity. We must have biblical authority for everything we do in the New Testament. As Brother Steve pointed out in his lesson, the Christian church and others do not have the authority for that which they are practicing today. Therefore, today, in, as we look at the New Testament, everything we do must be done under the very authority of Jesus Christ. No exceptions. And when it comes to the Lord's Supper, there is no exception. We have to follow the authority of Jesus Christ. One thing that we'll talk about with authority is the Bible teaches very explicitly that the Lord's Supper is only taken on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. Let's notice this. When you come together, therefore, into one place, it is not, it is not the evening of the Lord's Supper. That's not, he's not saying here that you're not coming together to take the Lord's Supper. That's not really why you're here. You go back to verse 17, he talks about how they had perverted and they were starting to pervert. He goes on verse 21, 22, and what they were doing to pervert it. He's saying you're coming together not for the right reason. Though you're coming together to partake the Lord's Supper, you're not doing it correctly. That's what he's saying in this passage. So we know that they were partaking of them the first day of the week when they did come together. Verse 33 of this same passage. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one with another. When they were coming together in the general assembly of the church to worship God in spirit and truth, they were coming together to eat or to partake of the Lord's Supper. It wasn't the only thing they were doing, but that was part of their worship. Part of why they were there? A big part of why they were there. As you'll see in other passages. Acts 20 and 7 tells us that on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, they came together for the specific purpose of worshiping God, and in that purpose specifically to take of the Lord's Supper. On the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. John said, John, or rather, rather Revelation 1, verse 9, He is in the Spirit of the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day, the first day of the week, when we come together and we take the Lord's Supper. We know that the Corinthians met on the first day of the week to worship and to give, as is stated in 1 Corinthians 16, it is evident when the Corinthians met, they took the Lord's Supper. When Paul corrected them in chapter 11, they had been partaking on a regular basis. However, they were partaking in an unworthy manner. So we can sum all this up very simply. It was their practice, first of all, when they came together to worship on the first day of the week to take the Lord's Supper when they met, 1 Corinthians 11 20. Secondly, we can observe very simply, it was their practice to meet upon the first day of the week, every first day of the week, as is stated in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, because they were to give upon the first day of the week. And number three, we see therefore it was their practice, when they did come together, upon the first day of the week, in worshiping God in spirit and truth, 
to partake of the Lord's Supper each and every Lord's Day. Justin Martyr, who was born about A.D. 100, wrote this. Though we may not agree with everything in this quote, it would establish the fact that they did partake of the Lord's Supper each and every first day of the week. He said, And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place. And the members of the apostles or writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of good things. Then we all rise together and pray. And, as we said before, when our prayer is ended, bread and wine and water are brought, and the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability, and the people of sense saying, Amen, and there is a distribution to each, and a participation of that over which our thanks have been given. Justin Martyr simply stated that they came together on Sunday, and on Sunday they partook of the Lord's Supper. That's very plain in what he stated. The writers of early, of early Christians outside of the New Testament proved that taking the Lord's Supper each Sunday was a consistent practice of the churches in the apostolic era, the second century, and several centuries after that. You can find it in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 1923, that very fact that it was stated they took the Lord's Supper each and every first day of the week. The New Shave Persog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, Volume 4, page 198, states the same thing. Wycliffe's Bible Encyclopedia, Volume 2, page 1049, once again states that very thing. That from the apostolic times onward, on the first day of every week, when the disciples came together, they partook of the Lord's Supper. And it's evident from both writings within the New Testament and secular writings, as well as what we often refer to as the church fathers, those men who were not inspired, who lived either during the time or shortly thereafter, the apostles, confirmed and verified that the Lord's Supper was taken each and every first day of the week. Under the law of Moses, the Jews were given a command, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Exodus 27. It's interesting that they were to observe the Sabbath day, but I've got a question. Which one? Did it matter which Sabbath day? Or the one that might want to meet one Sabbath and wait three or four weeks and meet another Sabbath and, or observe that Sabbath as a holy day? They understood. When the Bible told them, when God told them through Moses, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, that there was a Sabbath day that came around once a week and every single week they remembered that Sabbath day, they kept that Sabbath day holy, and they followed the instructions of God if they were to be blessed with God. That's not hard to understand. Why today when the Bible teaches us that we gather from the first day of the week to break bread, that men can't understand that, but they can go back and you can teach them or ask them to explain Exodus 27 and they'll tell you they'll remember and observe every Sabbath day. But the first day of the week is not to be observed when it comes to the Lord's Supper. That is what so many excuse me, people argue. Leroy Brownlow writes concerning this as well. Consistency demands that if they abandon the breaking of bread upon the first day of the week, that they also abandon the meeting together upon the first day of the week. One example is as binding as another. Why would we meet to observe the Lord's death monthly, quarterly, semi-annually or annually, but not observe the re resurrection on a weekly basis? It is more logical to observe the death, burial, and resurrection each week instead of only the resurrection. Thought about that? These religions come together on the first day of the week, and they engage in what they term as worship, Yet they fail to partake of the Lord's Supper because they look at that as an optional matter. Something, depending upon their particular denomination, the precedent set for it, either monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually, or maybe never, depending upon what they believe. And that is a practice that is often followed. And sadly enough, violating the teaching of the Bible, not only in this practice, but in many others as well, but especially in this practice, we see that they are violated. We have problems 
within the Lord's church with brethren who have taken various views of the Lord's Supper. Liberal movements among us for years have toyed and played with various items of worship to their own life, one of which is the Lord's Supper. We heard just about a year, year and a half ago, I believe instituted a year ago this month, Richland Hills Church, not too many hours up the road from here, where not only did Richland Hills add an instrumental service, by the way, that's where Rick actually preached that was part of some of the unity movements with the Christian church. They have now added the instrument. But also, they're preparing the Lord's Supper on Saturday because they view that just as necessary or just as expedient, I guess you would say, as the first day of the week. I want the authority, not only for their instrumental music, but I want their authority for taking the Lord's Supper on a Saturday, the seventh day, rather than the first day of the week as is commanded and directed explicitly by the teaching of the New Testament. But you think Rick actually is going to answer? He doesn't care. He's doing what he wants to do. Let me read you another thing that I've, I recently pulled from the internet. Brother Hatcher, you'll know this man I'm going to quote, of Stan Cliff Willis Wells. He wreaked havoc in your area for some time. A man by the name of Chris, Chris Seaton used to be at the Gateway Church in Pensacola. Uh, that was withdrawn from by Bellevue, I believe, in 1977, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was around 1977. I'll tell you how far back they have been off. They had Chris Seidman as their minister, and at that time I received their bulletin and couldn't eat before I read it. But anyway, here's something he stated. It was reported by another preacher that this event happened where he is now preaching here in Texas, unfortunately, at Farmer's Branch Church. They call it the Branch. Get on the website. I've been looking at the website recently. It'll give you more than enough to uh, <clears throat> regurgitate your food. Chris Seidman uh, Seisman, rather, Seisman. Chris Seisman said this. If you're watching Keith, uh, apologies. Chris Seisman said this concerning a couple at Farmer's Branch. I know a couple here at, at the branch who faced the greatest challenge to their marriage earlier this year. He was an influential executive working for a corporation who traveled out of town for a week on business. The corporation sent a new female executive with it. They wound up working late into the evening alone, and as often happens in that kind of context, their relationship quickly became personal. They wound up embracing before they got before he got a hold of himself, and the situation quickly retreated. The woman was embarrassed herself and quickly left. It was a sleepless night uh, for the man who was under this great conviction and guilt for what had happened. The next morning he called his wife and confessed. He then quickly called some of her closest sisters in Christ simply telling them that his wife needed them right now. Later his wife called and said, finish your work and get home as soon as you can. Well, after he arrived, without reading a lot more of this, I've got a section I want to read without reading the rest of this one section. He arrived back at DFW. Wife met him. They went out to eat as a family. He had small children. They went out to eat. They put the kids down. She said, we obviously need to talk. When he came to the living room, there, this is the kicker, there was wine and bread set out by his wife. She told him how hurt she was and how they had some work to do in the relationship, but that after all, God had forgiven her, how could she not forgive him? They prayed, wept, took communion together, and then she took him into the marriage bed that night. Now you tell me in the name of common sense what the Lord's Supper had to do with their marital problems? <laughs> What day of the week was it? Well, undoubtedly it wasn't on the Lord's Day because they weren't at the branch following the false doctrine there. They were at home late one evening. Now, where is their authority to protect the Lord's Supper when they have marriage problems? All couples face some difficulties from time to time in the marriage. It doesn't mean you whip out the wine and the bread, but let's take the Lord's Supper and we're going to work our marriage problems out. Now this will tell you the mindset to which people have gone in the church today when it comes to not only the New Testament, but when it comes to simply in this instance to the Lord's Supper and how perverted they are in their thinking about the Lord's Supper. 
It's kind of irritating me when I read it, but I guess it's not irritating to anybody. Amen. And surely, we don't want anyone to have marital problems, and, and it's a good thing that they were able to work out their problems. They should. But take the Lord's Supper. As a matter of fact, the title of this thing was the Lord's Supper and Sex. And it read you the title of what the article was from him. Now tell me what the Lord's Supper has to do with sex. What prompted her to set out the wine and the bread for them to partake of the Lord's Supper? And where was their authority in doing it? There was none. But then we have denominational folks who teach things just as bad, if not worse, than some of our liberal brethren. A website I found is how the Answering Church of Christ they always seem like they have to answer us because they don't like what the Bible teaches and don't like our practice of the Bible. So they always have to try to come up with these things to answer us. And, and this was specifically answering three preachers in the Virginia area, uh, Daniel. Uh, they were answering uh, James Oldfield, Johnny Robertson, and one other preacher. I don't recall his name right now, but they have television programs. And undoubtedly, at various times, all three of them have made reference to the Lord's Supper and the teaching of the New Testament about the Lord's Supper. And here's a man who didn't like it. So here's his website. He says facts about the Lord's Supper. Number one, he says, there is no scripture telling us when or how often to take communion. Oh, really? I thought we'd just discuss that. We're going to go in more detail uh, time permitting and discuss that even more. Number two, he states, there is no proof that Acts 27 passage refers to the Lord's Supper at all. Breaking, breaking bread was a term commonly used for eating a common meal, see Acts 2. And could have well have been the meaning here. Well, what could have well have been and what is the meaning are two different things. Now, if he thinks he has authority to prove that Acts 27 is referring to common meal, he needs to produce that, not just state an assumption. He doesn't, state any, he doesn't give any proof, he just states an assumption. Number three, to leave the occasion involved communion. We do not know if they felt any obligation to limit the practice to one particular day or if it was even merely a matter of convenience. It doesn't matter what day or whatever convenience you, you take. Number four, we cannot be sure exactly what day the breaking of bread occurred. The Jewish day began at sunset and went to the next sunset. They may have met in the afternoon of the first day and uh, with the last meeting into the night, the second day, Paul preached at midnight, and that was after they broke bread. We'll prove that. But there's another assumption. They may have met. What they may have done and what the Bible specifically says are two different things. This man must be living in some fantasy world. Uh, some of our brethren are in that same world, I believe, but he's in some fantasy world, it seems like. Number five, he states there are only two clear scriptural references to actual observation of the Lord's Supper. One was when the Lord instituted it, and the other was the observance of calling. Both observances was in conjunction with a meal. There is no command and no example of a communion, including the bread and fruit of the vine. Church of Christ practice surely was borrowed from our predecessors in the Reformation movement, who surely borrowed it from the Roman Catholic Church. There is no command, no example. I believe we just read a moment ago, Acts 20 and verse 7, an approved example. And he already stated that that's not the Lord's Supper, but he failed to see an example anywhere in the New Testament. He then has his conclusions. He, he has a section talking about Johnny's assumptions, talking about Johnny Robertson. Then he has his conclusion. Without reading all of the conclusion, uh, number three in this, he says it is very beneficial for a church to come together and observe the Lord's Supper. The church of Christ's practice of Sunday communion is fully accepted. Well, according to what he stated earlier, it doesn't seem like it's fully acceptable to him. He doesn't like it. But he said there is no reason to suggest a change. Well, he just stated we shouldn't be doing it on the first day of every week. Now he's saying, well, don't change. Just keep on doing it in the church of Christ. You're fine. Again, think about the logic or the illogic use. But he states there's a reason to object to an assumption based instance that it is sinful to observe it any other time or have any other food items present. So he's stating his conclusion that when the Lord instituted that Passover meal of the Lord's Supper, they would receive the common meal. That's what they would do in the car. It was purely acceptable. It was acceptable. Why did Paul condemn the Corinthians for doing what they were doing. Yet he upholds the practice of Corinth as one being acceptable based on his own conclusions, again, his fantasy world, rather than what was stated in the New Testament. One more thing I'll read, and I won't read the entire thing, but this was uh, another website, The Lord's Supper, How Lessons in the Past, Number 4, by D.J. Hart and John R. Muther. Uh, they extracted this from the ordained servant, volume 6, number 4, back in October 1997. 
uh, that talks about baptism, or rather talks about, uh, talks about baptism, but also about the Lord's Supper. And they're part of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And they said there are two different instructions about the Lord's Supper. On one hand, it describes the Lord's Supper along with baptism as an occasional element of public worship. On the other hand, it directs congregations to celebrate the Lord's Supper frequently. So which is it? The literalist might ask. Occasional or frequent? Well, figure it out. What are you kept them to say? First day of the week. In good Presbyterian fashion, the directory leaves that set for sessions to determine the frequency, which may be determined by each session as it may judge most conducive to edification. So whenever it edifies, it takes it. If it doesn't edify, you leave it alone. He talks about when they were established, when they took it. Many uh, Orthodox Presbyterian churches have increased observance to bi-monthly or monthly, rather than their semi-annually or annual observances. And then he asks, should churches celebrate the Lord's Supper weekly? As sessions wrestle with the issue of frequency, a look at how Presbyterians have practiced communion in the past might be instructed. Then he goes back to Calvin. He says Calvin, students of Calvin, are aware that it was his desire that churches practice weekly communion. Well, at least Calvin got one thing right. He felt like weekly communion was what was to be observed. Calvin believed that this frequency could be found both in apostolic teaching and example, and that weekly observance was also the practice of the church fathers. Well, of course it was, and of the apostles and instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have much more on that, but that's all I'm going to read for sake of time. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 is a binding verse on us today. This is an approved example that authorizes us to partake of the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis. How can we know that it's approved? Well, if God didn't approve the example of Acts 20 and verse 7, why didn't he specifically condemn uh, these folks for doing what they did at Troas? Why didn't Paul, when he was in their midst, Tell them, well, I know we're taking this this week, and you you partake of it on a weekly basis, but the Bible does not directly take it on a weekly basis. Therefore, you need to stop. Why did Paul do that? They'd preach at midnight, and as then the preacher knows, and we get wound up, and we can get a little extra time, and we feel like there's a situation we need to be dealt with, we can deal with it. Why did Paul deal with it? If their practice was in violation of God's will, in harmony with the teaching of the New Testament, it wasn't. It was exactly in harmony with that teaching. That's why we can know that that example is approved of God. McGarvey states this about the practice of the Lord's Supper. When we can determine even a, a good degree of probability, an apostolic custom in our own judgment should yield to it. So all parties have a reason in reference to the Lord's Day. The information is contained in the New Testament together with a universal custom known to have existed in the churches during the age succeeding that of the apostles has been decided by them uh, all as sufficient to establish the divine authority and religious observance of the Lord's Day. And yet they have not consented to the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper, the proof of which is precisely the same. It is the universal testimony of antiquity that the churches of the second century broke the loaf every Lord's Day and considered it a custom of apostolic appointment. Now it cannot be doubted that the apostolic churches had some regular interval at which to celebrate this institution and seeing that all the evidence there is in the case in favor of a weekly celebration, there is no room for reasonable doubt that this was the interval which they adopted. There's no room for doubt. It was specifically stated that in the apostolic time, they partook the Lord's Supper every single week. Why do we do it today in the Church of Christ? Because the Bible so directs us. There is an apostolic example in Acts 27 that shows they did it in the first day of the week. We have writings from those who were not inspired men of God, but who wrote about events that took place both in the first and the second century that stated they did it on a weekly basis. What other proof do we need? If it was not approved of God, then it would have been condemned by God. Denominational preachers, though, they don't have a problem with arguing uh, for weekly contribution. Now, they may falsely argue monthly and quarterly, semi-annual and annual, uh, for taking the Lord's Supper as being sufficient. They'll fight to pick and toenail uh, to change the contribution to that. Can you see a denominational preacher wanting to change the contribution of monthly, quarterly, semi-annual? Here, Texas might throw a gun on you. <laughs> because they see the need for weekly observance of contributions why not the Lord's Supper? Taught by the same inspired apostle to the same church. They observe it. Why not observe it today? The Lord's Supper is a wonderful event. When, as Christians, we enter into the worship and commune around the table of our Lord, 
remembering his great sacrifice. As stated in the lesson, it is not only done in retrospect, but in prospect, looking forward to the coming of Christ. The next time as God's children, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, may we in all seriousness and humility reflect upon the very purpose for which it is taken, that it may have a deeper meaning in our lives, that we observe it correctly, and that it will help us grow closer to God and closer to one another. As we extend the invitation this evening to you, it may be that as a child of God you're here tonight and you're not faithful to God. In times past you may have been a faithful child, but you've wandered away. It may be that you've been unfaithful and you've been partaking the Lord's Supper, you've been partaking of it in an unworthy manner. In that that your heart is not right with God, not saying that you shouldn't, but saying that to be accepted of God, truly accepted as a faithful child, your heart must be right and your life must be right. If you're here tonight and you've wondered why, why not come back? Repent of your sins. Confess those sins and pray for the forgiveness of them. If you're here and you're not a New Testament Christian, you've never obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, why not make the day the day of your salvation? Through hearing the message, the Word of God, the teaching of our Lord in the New Testament, can produce faith in your heart. And upon your faith you can repent of your sins. Confess that faith before all and be immersed in baptism. To reach the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary that we do remember each Lord's day for which we are thankful and it encourages us to live even more faithfully. You can think back to that sacrifice of Christ and that, that should cause you to realize your sins and prompt you to change your heart and obedience to the gospel. The Lord will add you to his church. He'll write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And as you live a faithful Christian life, one day heaven will be your home. And there are all those who do need to respond in any way tonight. We urge you to come right now. Quite a good standing while we're saved.